morning, everyone, and welcome uh, this morning. And we, of course, have received the good news that uh, we are going into a time when we're starting to reopen slowly but surely, and we are in phase one of that. And uh, in terms of special announcements, there isn't much to add except that Grove Christian Camp has given word that at this point we are able to do summer camps and we are planning towards that and uh, we are looking forward to that possibility and so far we're even able to keep our original camp schedule. Uh, there will be some changes going on with that in terms of what we're doing at camp but uh, what happens with us is kind of the same in that we were going to try and bring groups of at least 10 kids um, to camp our, our 10 boys and 10 girls. Um, Young Life has not really kind of landed on what they're going to be doing yet. And, uh, but we are hopeful that soon we can start to meet with the uh, middle schoolers and the teens in the groups of 10 or less and begin to do some things with them to kind of rebuild momentum leading up to camp. Um, but there are things that the, uh, especially the governor's office and um, other agencies are excited about, which is that we get to re-engage with kids, especially with schools being closed. Um, so that's something to be excited about. Um, in terms of the church and us reopening, um, if you would like to stay tuned to after the end of the service, I will give you an update on where we are in that and uh, sort of how we're uh, trying to move forward with uh, reopening uh, where everyone will still continue to be reached and feel like they can be a part of the church if they choose to return or not. So that will be at the end of the service. Um, but this morning as we, as we go into our service, we're going to be in Acts chapter 3 where we have uh, Peter and John are going out on their first sort of excursion um, as two disciples going out to make disciples. And a, a big um, a big topic within this chapter that I that sort of jumped out at me was the idea of people being raised up. And I know if you are like me, then during this pandemic and the lockdown, that most likely there were times where you felt down. I know for me it would kind of depend on the day. There's good days and there's bad days. Um, days where I'm excited to get up and do the best I can with what we can do, and there's days where um, I don't feel very uh, excited about things. And one of the things that uh, the Bible talks about is this idea that God wants to bless us, and a way he talks about that is being able to, for us to look him in the face, and for the, the power that comes from that. So our scripture reading this morning is from Numbers chapter 6. And there are some good things that happen in Numbers, but I think one of the most uh, popular passages that I'd like to read for you is this blessing that was given, uh, a, a priestly blessing that was given to the Israelites that you may, once I start reading, know very well. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. As we come to worship this morning, I pray that we could seek the face of our Lord so that his face can shine upon us no matter how low we may be feeling and that his love would raise us up this morning in worship. Let us start with prayer. Lord, I'm so grateful that there are some, some bright spots that have kind of emerged. I'm grateful um, that businesses are able to reopen here in phase one. I'm most of all grateful that uh, many people that we love and care for were spared during this, um, both uh, physically and financially. And I want to lift up those who this morning are coming to you with concerns, though, about the future. I pray that we could leave them all at your feet, knowing that we are your children and that you love us, and that we can look at you and look at how you are looking down to us as a loving parent who wants what's best for us, and that your love would just shine upon us and that we would feel lifted up and empowered through you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning 
humbly, knowing that you are the creator of all these good things that we see around us, knowing that you are the ruler over every single thing, and yet also knowing that you have chosen us to be your very children, that you have adopted us and raised us up to become part of your family. And we just thank you. And we worship you. Oh,
Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Father, we thank you so much for your promises to us. Your promise that if we will believe in you, that we will live eternally with you in heaven. We thank you so much that you will take care of us and provide for our needs, and that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you. And we, we just ask that you will help us to trust in you more and more every day, and that we will stand in your promises throughout our entire lives. Father, we just ask that your kingdom would come just spread throughout this whole world. We ask that you would help us all to share your love with our neighbors, to share your love with, with people around the world because we can. We can reach out to all sorts of people around this world with with technology anymore, it's just as easy as our neighbors. And we are thankful for that opportunity, and we pray that we'll make the most of it. And Lord, we just want to lift up those who are sick, and we just ask for your healing presence, and that you will perform miracles in lives that will draw more people to you. We lift up those who are, are grieving, and those who are are worried and those who are are just really struggling during this time mentally we just pray that you will give them the peace that surpasses all understanding and father um, we just we ask that you will help us all to to come through this closer to you and that you will bring an end to the, the destruction of this disease soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we'll be continuing our series in the book of Acts, especially looking at how we as Christians can navigate through life and how they were able to navigate through all the different pressures and difficulties as disciples to bring about the early church and how we can grow the church by learning from them. And this morning uh, in Acts chapter 3, I, I came up with the title of Just Show Up. And uh, because we have the account of Peter and John uh, arriving at the temple and healing someone and then being able to share the gospel with those around them as well as the person that they were able to heal. And uh, there's been a lot of times in my life where I could say that I was introduced to things as trial by fire. I remember learning how to flip um, eggs in a pan um, just with the pan and how many eggs died that day um, being learned how to be flipped. And, my first structural fire was definitely a trial by fire where I was kind of thrown in there. And sometimes it is better just to kind of throw yourself in there. And, but when it comes to personal interactions, we can't get away from the fact, no matter what, that there's a little apprehension when it comes to this topic of discipleship because at, at all levels we experience the fear of rejection. Um, I know that for years and years I've been doing ministry and I've been interacting with people and there is still this underlying fear of if I share the gospel with someone, then most likely I will be rejected. And the good news that hopefully you get overall from this sermon is that when you show up for someone, it doesn't really matter if it necessarily goes the way you hoped because no matter what, you've actually touched that person's life. Last year when I was taking the kids on the mission trip in Africa, 
we went from village to village to talk to people. And even then, when it was my turn as a visiting missionary and everyone had high hopes for me, my turn to share the gospel, there was still this apprehension deep down of, am I saying the right things? Am I doing the right things? At the same time, I had the fun job of having these kids that I brought with me and I'd say, you're up. It's your turn to talk to this person. And they would have some apprehension. But out of that, out of those interactions, all of them felt like they had done a wonderful thing, especially at the end of the week when a number of the people they had spoken to in the villages showed up at church and shared how much they were touched to be visited and talked to. It didn't have so much to do with the words as much as the way that they were valued and seen. For those of us who are going out there as disciples, the biggest thing that we can do for others is just show up for them, to be there for them. And that's what we'll be talking about this morning in Acts chapter 3. So I'll start with the first five verses. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried in the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So we have the, this account where a man is brought to the temple, and he's brought to the gate beautiful. And hopefully you guys can see this image up here. But uh, it says that the man was most likely here on the outside court of the temple. And when, when he met Peter and John. And Luke, who writes the, or the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, says that this happens at 3 o'clock. So he was kind of being brought for closing time at a shift when people would come after they were done, they would go to the temple to go and worship and pray and give tithes and offerings. So this person was someone who was, was crippled from birth. His family would drop him off at the gate to beg in hopes that he could earn his keep, at least for himself, if not to help their family. And this is where Peter and John met him, was outside. And this is also significant because by the Old Testament law, he was not fit to go inside the temple. He was someone that, be, that they believed because of sin, was the reason that he was outside of that gate and had been crippled for life. So he sat outside and he begged. And this is where Peter and John met him. And we have this great expression where he says, look at us. This is the first time where this topic of being raised up comes from. I encourage you, as you go through this passage this morning, so look at all the times that you see the word raise or raised up in this passage. This concept comes all the way from where I read this morning in Numbers, where the Lord makes His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. I know that as a parent and as a teacher at a school, usually when I tell a kid to look me in the eyes or to look at my face as they talk to me, it's because I'm trying to get out the truth. Because usually, if they're looking me in the eyes, I can figure out if they're telling me the truth or not. But in this situation, it has nothing to do with telling the truth or not. It has to do with valuing the people that are being talked to. Even with the homeless today, one of the things that homeless advocates will say is that you don't have to necessarily give them money or give them things that they desire, but if you could look them in the eye, if you could greet them, if you could treat them like humans, be polite as you interact with them, it makes them feel so much more like a human being. In Psalms 4, 6 it says, Many are saying, Who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. Many of us live with shame and guilt and feel like God wouldn't even want 
to interact with us. Over and over in the Psalms, it will ask God to put His countenance on them and to raise their countenance, which means to raise their spirits by Him acknowledging them. They feel that possibly what's going on with them is this lack of love, even though we know that's not the case. God loves them and wants to interact with them. He wants His face to shine upon them. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, um, which I introduced a little bit last week, is the passage on love that we like to read at weddings. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says that you can have this interaction of love with the Lord, where no longer do you just barely know each other, but it's like you're face to face, and you're fully known. In this brief interaction where Peter looks this man and says, look at me, he's saying, you have value, you are important. As everyone else walks by, we want you to know that you have value. Continuing on from verse 6 to verse 10. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So what happens, to back up to our image, is after he has been healed, he has been able to leave the outer door, and he has been able to enter into the temple which he had not been able to enter into as someone with this disability that he had had his entire life. He felt like he could enter the presence of God. I think that one of the biggest things that we have as disciples of Jesus that we can offer people is the, the good news that they can, no matter how they may feel about God, that they can actually enter the outside and come on into the inside. I've often joked about people I've interacted with about coming to the church, and some of them have even said, but if I go to church, I'm sure God will strike me down. And I, I'm not sure what to tell them, um, except that if God were to strike them down, that He could do it from anywhere. He doesn't have to wait till you show up at church. But the fact of the matter is, and I try and tell them, is that no, God, God isn't only happy if you're in the church, He's happy if you just have a relationship with Him. And this guy was able to leave the outside and come to the inside. And I think that one of the things that we have to wrestle with is how many people are actually out there wanting to have a relationship with the Lord, but they feel like they're on the outside and wish someone would come and say, you have value, we need you on the inside presence of the Lord. I'll get back to where I was. This new person received a new life. He asked for money. I will be very open that uh, money is one of those one of the things spiritually that I always wrestle with. Not the love of it, the fear of not having what I need is mainly what I wrestle with. I have for years. I think it's sort of a, a circumstance to uh, things in my childhood. But I know that when money gets tough, I begin to have that money become that idol in my life again, where I begin to worry and start to do things that I, I shouldn't to, to increase my money. And even as we've lived upriver, I can't remember the amount of odd jobs I've had to try and make things stay afloat. But at the end of the day, it really wasn't money that kept things going over the years. And at the end of the day, that money, man, it came and it went. There are things that during all the years have really truly mattered. And there are things that I've worked on that have really, truly mattered. And I think a lot of times when we're deep and dark and feeling low and on the outside, we're hoping that a little money will change the situation. And I've even heard people say, when life clears up, I'll start coming to church again. 
when the money clears up, I'll start coming to church again. But unfortunately, the money is something that is always just coming and going here today and gone tomorrow. He received something that was more valuable than money. And I, I say this with caution because there are people out there who have real financial need right now. And I don't think that's the point here. I think that they could have given him money, but there was no amount of money that could have fixed the situation that he was in. And sometimes that is the gift we give with Christ, is that there are some folks that no amount of money will necessarily dig them out of the hole that they're in. But Jesus can. A new life can. One of the greatest miracles that can never be disputed is when someone goes before friends and they knew him, sort of like the people who knew this man at the gate, as someone that was really down, really had a rough life, and they come forward and say, I'm good now, and it's because of Jesus. There's a lot in the Bible that I cannot prove to anyone. There's a lot of supernatural things that I cannot recreate, but I have noticed that a changed person is something that most people won't accuse of being fake. And I think sometimes is the bigger miracle that people are looking for. They didn't just help him exit in his broken condition. By the authority of Jesus Christ, he was saved. There's a lot of things that are just kind of band-aids to, to broken situations. And Jesus says, I want to be for people the cure. The thing that finally gets them out. And that's what Peter and John were offering this person. It wasn't just the offering that they were bringing to the temple that day and giving it to them, him instead. They said, I want to bring him real healing. And what's interesting is that they do it in this passage, it even says, by the name of Jesus Christ. And we're going to get into that a little bit more here. I had a friend, um, he actually was a part of this church, and uh, he worked for uh, the, fish, the fish hatchery down in Lieberg, and he told me this story, um, and, I, and he told it as, uh, as in sort of a, an addition. After I was done preaching, he told me this story, and it had to do with the authority of Christ. And he said that he, would, he worked there at the fish hatchery, um, there at Lieberg, the Lieberg Dam, I should say. And uh, he was on his lunch break, and he saw a guy, he had planned to go fishing on his lunch break. Um, and he saw a guy there that he uh, kind of uh, commented as one of his repeat offenders. Um, but he went out there, and he started fishing, and he didn't really want to uh, deal with the guy. Um, but the guy saw him fishing, and said, you're not supposed to be fishing, you're off duty. Or you're, on, you're not supposed to be fishing, you're on duty. And uh, he, he, he responded, no, I'm not on duty. I'm on my lunch break. And then he thought he'd get smart. And he said, he asked that person, he says, can I see your license? Do you have your fishing license? And the person responded, you can't ask me for my license. You're off duty. I think that as Christians, we sometimes believe that there's times that we're on duty and there's times that we're off duty as Christians. Maybe there's social time where we're not really on duty as Christians. But when it comes to our faith, we're kind of always on duty. I know that as a first responder, if I'm in my uh, fire gear or not, if emergency happens in front of me, I have to respond. As a mandatory reporter through the school, through the church, through the fire department, if something happens in front of me that has to be reported, there's no off hours. Within our faith, there really, through the authority of Christ, Christ has not really given us any off hours. He says, you're on duty all the time. And I, you may hear that as the bad news, but also within this account, we have the authority of Christ being what heals the person. The authority of Christ is what makes him able to stand up. And I'll say this about this passage as well, is that I know that I have been taught this passage, especially at Sunday school, kind of out of context, many, many times. 
here's Peter and here's John and they find this man and they tell him they're going to heal him through the name of Jesus Christ and they ask him to grab them by the hand so they can pick him up. This time around, as I read through it, thinking that two weeks ago Peter was the person who was denying Christ, John and Peter were the ones running to the tomb together, that most likely these two very human people, as they said these words and reached out their hand to pick him up, were most likely feeling a little apprehensive about what's about to happen next. All they had was their faith. There's been many times where I've acted in faith and I'm not sure of what has happened in that instance or not. And there's times that I've acted and I've shown up and miraculous things have happened after the fact, in the fact, that I wasn't even prepared for. But Peter and John decided to show up for this man. In the name of Jesus, this phrase, in the name of Jesus, is not a magic incarnation or mantra. Uh, the disciples went through this on their second missionary trip. They found out that they, they said we'd been saying all the right things, and um, we weren't able to cast out this one demon, and Jesus had to explain to them that some things are a little bit harder than others. Jesus is our only access to, to God. It gives Christ the credit and the recognition. In verse 34 or 36 uses the name in Acts are with reference to Jesus' power and authority. Nine of those are in chapters 3 through 4. So in the book of Acts we have just numerous times and in fact if you go through the New Testament in the name of Jesus has been used a number of times and I think sometimes we have been taught that this is almost something that we can say like a magic spell, but it has to do more with whose badge we're wearing and if we're on duty or not. Continuing from verses 11 to 16, while the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to the men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us, as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our Father, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One, and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him up from the dead. You are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that gives, um, that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. I'm not sure what Peter and John's plans were when they went to the temple that day. We don't really know. I know that sometimes I go to places with uh, plans and those plans change. The number one person that likes to change plans is God. God likes to change plans quite a bit. Um, I got to interact with the church that rescued me in the mission trip uh, this last summer, and it was a great interaction, and I thought, wow, not only did we get rescued by this church, but now I have this relationship with this pastor and this family up at this church, and I'm not sure what God's doing with it, but I'm excited. Out of a mess, God said, I have a plan. And from this interaction, this time that Peter and John show up for this man, an opportunity is earned with the people around. I love the words that says, while the man, the beggar, held, and, and in some translations you say clung to Peter and John. He's been allowed to go into the temple, he's been healed, he's inside Solomon's Colonnade, and he's just holding on to Peter and John and so excited about the fact that his life has changed. 
There's so many times that uh, I've, I've gotten to experience people who've turned their life around and that smile they have for weeks and weeks. And from that, Peter begins to speak to the people there about what they have seen. Peter is speaking with grace when it comes to rejecting Jesus. In this passage here, we have, we have Peter in three different ways telling the people, you rejected, you disowned, you killed. But I don't think he's saying it with, with intent of being harsh because Peter knows what it feels like to reject in three different ways. I think he's talking to these Israelites with the amount of, of grace that he most likely felt when Jesus forgave him those three times when he sat there for breakfast. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? I think Peter wants them, just like him, to get it, finally. He says, you disowned him, you rejected him, and you killed him. But it says there, Another time of our raising, God raised him from the dead. And he gives the authority back to Jesus. He, right here at the beginning, he says, why are you astonished? It's not by our power that we did this. Finishing off with verses 17 through 23. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that he, uh, through Christ would suffer, repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago, through the holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. And here we have another section where it talks about raising up. In his description of Jesus, he says, Jesus was a prophet raised up by God. And here I have it highlighted, he says, you must listen to everything he tells you. So Peter says, I didn't do this on my own power. I did it through Christ who you've been told about and told about and told about. And even the prophets have told you about it. And he was raised up for you to be a prophet. And now you must listen to everything he tells you. I think we're seeing a new Peter in this time that we're not used to. Because Peter himself wasn't very good to listening to Jesus all the time. But this, this new prophet, not one that attacks the authorities. I think the Israelites had grown up with the, this image of a prophet as someone who was going to come and speak to the king and speak to the Romans and correct them and tell them how they were wrong. But Jesus wasn't that kind of prophet. The type of prophet they were used to was someone who dealt with the leadership to point out their hypocrisy. A new prophet for you that you are supposed to listen to. That's what Peter says Jesus is. Jesus is for us someone who's going to come alongside us and in that healing process that we're looking for, that low point where we're asking to be raised, he says he's going to speak to things that you may need to change. And I think Peter is saying this as someone who's been through it. I know that there are young pastors that I work with, there are young life leaders that I work with, and one of the things that I say that I, I remember people telling me and I didn't even listen to them very much is that the Lord's going to work on you. And you're going to learn some things. I know that one of the things is that I remember being rejected as I went out to deal, work with youth, as a youth pastor, I remember being rejected and how much that hurt. But I'm to the point where I understand the hearts and the motives and the thoughts that I'm no longer hurt because I know that there actually isn't much malice behind it. I know that 
deep down, every time I reach out to them, they actually appreciate it. So, getting out there. God has asked us, like Peter and John, to just go out. We have no idea that they were, had been told to go to the temple that day, that there was a plan, a ministry plan. The passage literally just starts that they decided to go to the temple that day. That's like much of us right now. My plans have changed day by day, moment by moment. I didn't know about the conference that was going to tell me about um, the church's reopening until 4 p.m. on Monday, and the meeting was at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. And I already had two other meetings on t at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. And I had to just run with it. Jesus asked us, first of all, to just show up for people as disciples. And one thing I'll say is that I strongly feel like a lot of Christians, especially in Lane County, do a really good job of this in various different ways. I think we're working in a very difficult area, and most of the people that are Christians that I run into upriver and in Eugene and in Springfield, they really do a good job of this. And I would like to just encourage you to continue doing that. Showing up through phone calls, texts, emails, whatever it might be right now as we practice social distancing to the best of our abilities, you may be surprised how much you make someone feel elevated, raised up, and closer to God. Because at the end of the day, we have this enemy who's constantly speaking in our ear, letting us feel like we're not that important, that maybe God doesn't love us, maybe we've messed up, and God just won't forgive us this time. And for you to come alongside them and remind them one more time, no, God loves you. You can raise them up. As we show up, we don't have to know the right words, the right things to do, or even have the best speeches in place. I thought it was very interesting that this sermon that Peter gave is very much a very condensed version of the sermon he gave in chapter 2. He said, I want to give you guys the cliff notes of the sermon the Holy Spirit gave me last week. He didn't write a new one. I was encouraged in that as a pastor. Peter just had to reuse the same one, just make it shorter, and it was better. <laughs> but he, he says, be Christ-minded and Christ-centered when you show up. Not off-duty. If you go with the idea that I am on duty as a disciple, as a Christian, and everywhere you go, there is going to be a Christ-minded and Christ-centered focus to every interaction we have. When we believe we're off-duty, then we begin to say things and do things that counter that. Take the risk to talk straight to the heart of someone. I know that realistically, any time we go and talk to someone, there is the fear of rejection, the fear of hurt, maybe even the fear of conflict. And I think that it's very important that we even see in this passage that there was an earning of the right to speak to the hearts of people. But if you've been showing up for someone for months and months or years and years, then you most likely have earned the right to maybe speak. I encourage you that if you've been practicing the challenge I gave in chapter 1 of praying every morning, asking for God to set things up for you, and you see a situation arising where you can speak to someone's heart, that you be like Peter and John and reach out and just push a little bit. And most of all, I say that as you guys go out, that your countenance be raised. Know that Jesus loves you. I know that for a lot of people this time has been a time of darkness and hardship and uncertainty. Know that Jesus, and more importantly, that God loves you. Know that Jesus went through a lot of difficult stuff and doesn't want to, to feel like he can't hear you or doesn't feel what you're going through or may not even have sympathy for you because I think that with the life he lived, he most likely does. Most of all, I want you to know that if you're feeling low and feeling like God doesn't love you, 
that He does. God wants to restore you to a new place, like the person in this story, where you feel like you can look Him in the face again, and that God would be able to shine upon you with love. And that you can not only take that love and receive it, but you have the ability then to go out and share it with others as well. Let us end in prayer. Lord, I'm so thankful for all the people that um, showed up for me, in even in small ways. Um, I, as I prepared this sermon, I even thought about the people who just participated. There were those who led things um, that brought me to the Lord. But then there were those who were even added to the situation just by being there. Um, kids that have gone to camp with me when I was growing up. Adults who were just part of teams with me. And all the things that they added by just being there. Sometimes we feel like we're not that important. But you want us to know that you uh, created us. And that you're raising us up to be great three things individually through our gifts and talents and all the things that make us special. I pray that as we go out this week um, as Christians, either through social distancing or if we have to uh, interact face-to-face -face with people, that we would just be there for them, that we would show up for them. And that if there's an opportunity that we've been praying for, and the time has come to speak to someone's heart and really stretch out in faith, and, and really engage with them, that, that we would just take that step of faith and speak to their heart, knowing that, you're, that you will be in that situation, you'll be speaking through us, and that you've been working with that person before we got there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
for being here this morning, and I'll end with a quick prayer. And for those of you who'd like to stay tuned in here for a minute, I'll give you a brief description of um, what we were told about uh, reopening the church. But let us end in prayer. Lord, I am so thankful that we uh, could be called saved. I'm so grateful for the new life that we have received. And I pray that we would go out as disciples two by two and we would just make the most of every situation. I pray that as we go out this week that we would just consider ourselves on duty and know that we have the authority of you behind us as we interact with the people around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This Tuesday, uh, or Monday, we, we were invited to a, uh, a meeting, a webinar that was put on by the governor's office about uh, reopening churches. Um, I should tell you that as uh, not too long ago, I'm not sure exactly when this changed, but uh, last I had checked, phase one churches were not going to be allowed to reopen, um, but I got this notification inviting me to this uh, webinar, and I uh, after listening to it, and I had some other pastors kind of help take notes, um, we, there are some things that they said, some key takeaways. Um, much like most of phase one, we'd have to have under 25 people. Um, we cannot have any form of eating. Um, if we wanted to have communion, we were going to have to have um, sort of the pre-sealed um, cup and, and wafer that we can order, which isn't that big of a deal. Um, but some other things that uh, were kind of a little bit more on the difficult side is that although we could allow folks to come and worship six feet apart, um, there we would not be allowed to have any singing other than uh, Katie. And we would um, also, there we would not be able to um, eat afterwards or and they kind of strongly encourage the lack of touching and hugging and sort of the things I think a lot of people have been really looking forward to in coming back to church. Um, that being said, um, in terms of us reopening, the bigger issue to me um, for our church out here in the woods has to do with our internet. Um, because if we were to reopen for the folks that felt like they could return to church uh, we would then want to be able to reach those who were not ready to return online. And unfortunately right now our internet capabilities would not um, meet that need. Uh, when we tried at the beginning to do church live, um, from here the internet uh, was found to be lacking. And so we, we are currently waiting for our internet to be upgraded. Um, we are switching from CenturyLink to Spectrum and we are still waiting for that to happen as many are. But my hopes is that if we are to reopen the service on Sunday morning, that we could then broadcast that live to, the, to anyone who chooses to remain at home um, during this, um, so that everyone would be able to be reached at this, um, sort of the same way, in the same capacity. Um, because as, as of right now, I have not heard that there isn't someone that hasn't been able to engage with us this way. So I'm hoping that we will be able to meet together soon, um, but I'd like it to be in a way where uh, no one is kind of left behind or left without being able to engage while we wait for the internet to improve. So that's sort of where we're at. Um, I, if you have any questions, a lot of your stipulations actually make a lot of sense to me um, as someone who's been having to keep up with how this virus acts and behaves. Um, through EMS stuff. So if there's any questions or concerns you have or you'd like an explanation for some of the things, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me and I can explain it to you. Um, it's it's uh, not something I want to go into, but it, what they're saying does make a lot of sense. Other than that, we're just going to keep on meeting the way we have um, until we're able to kind of make it equitable for everyone in the church who would, uh, so they can have a choice of coming and being here um, through the guidelines or remaining at home a little bit longer. And that's all I have to say about it. Um, so we're still waiting for that internet to come in, and as soon as that comes in, then we can start working towards uh, reopening the church for Sunday mornings. Blessings. Have a good week.